Great. So welcome to the Java EQ user group event with Nicholas Frankel today. And we are having someone from Hazelcast here who will talk about a change data capture use case designing an evergreen cache. Um, while people are now joining the room in Big Marker, say hello in the chat, say from where are you joining and make you familiar with the things. Or for those who know that already, um, just say hello to your, your friends. I'm Patrick from the Java user group. We'll have a short introduction mm -hmm. and then actually we'll hand over to Nicolas. Um, yeah, as we usually do. So here. As you know, we have different formats and we will also record this talk so it will be available on YouTube. And the great thing about that being on YouTube, if you are subscribed to the YouTube channel from the Java user group, then actually like hit also the bell button so you get notified even if you are not participating now live, right? So you see probably tomorrow or on Saturday morning and the talk actually online. Um, we also have a Slack channel, so you can participa uh, participate here as well. We have some discussions, like also some information about like talks which are going on. And also like recently, um, Simon um, from, from Burn said, like, wouldn't it be nice to have this person for a talk? And definitely we agreed and we will make this possible. So actually get in touch with us and that's actually awesome, right? And as you know, also at the end of the talks, we have a feedback form. So if you leave a um, big marker, then you would, you would get automatically forwarded. And this helps us actually to improve the quality of what we are doing here with these talks. Be aware of that we have a delay. So if Nicholas is asking questions and you're answering in the chat or vice versa, um, it has some delay and sometimes there is an awkward silence and that's just like, because we are 15 seconds ahead of you. So that means we are talking from the future to you. Yes. And there is a chat, as you know, please use it. That's great. Write your um, things here. And if you have questions, please use the Q and A part. It will help me actually to filter all the things from the noise so that I can ask Nicolas afterwards the questions. And that makes it also a bit more interactive. So like if you have questions and if I see them fit to the talk, I might interrupt him because he told me just before he's talking to the wall all day. So he likes to have some personal interaction and I will do my best. And the polls we don't do today. So that's why I skip over. Now, um, I'm sure Nicholas will also like introduce himself. This is just like the text we have also on the website from the Java user group and also an older picture where he's still wearing glasses, right? But he just told before that um, he is not using them for a while now. Okay, great. That means thank you for joining, Nicholas. I'm really looking forward to your talk and I, I'm sure I can learn something today. So it's... Okay. Hallo zusammen, also ich hätte gern äh, diesen Vortrag in Deutsch zu präsentieren, aber leider mein Deutsch ist nicht gut genug, also ich werde es in Französisch äh, präsentieren. Ne, das war, das war ein Witz. Uh, I, I will talk English, sorry, yeah, I, I'm, I have this French sense of humor. Um, oh, I need to switch. Now to this. Um, so thanks to be here. Let's talk about a change data capture use case, how you can design an evergreen cache. Um, I had these like slides where uh, this is uh, the like the official bio that I send to conferences. What you just need to remember is I've been a developer or a tech guy for, uh, for, for a long time. Now I am a developer advocate. And well, I became interested in change data capture and data streaming. I work for a company called Hazelcast. Uh, we have actually two products. Uh, if you are Java developers, I think that you probably know us uh, for our in-memory data grid. And if you don't know, um, you can think about an in-memory data grid as uh, data structures 
that uh, you can distribute over a network of nodes. So instead of being limited by a single GVM, you can either replicate or shard your data over several nodes. And JETS, I will uh, tell about JETS during this talk because I will be using it. So um, I won't uh, delve upon it further. If at any point, as, as Patrick mentioned, you have questions, feel free uh, to, to sit, like to write them down in the chat and I will do my best uh, to answer them. So this is our agenda uh, for today. Um, first, why do we cache? Uh, I mean, it's the talk about caching. Why, why do we cache? And uh, one issue we have uh, when we use a cache is to keep the data in the cache in sync with uh, the source of truth. So how can we do that? There are probably several alternatives. We will look through some of them. And then I will talk about one that is pretty popular right now, change data capture. And I will describe a bit the Bezium, which is a change data capture implementation uh, provided by Red Hat. And finally, I will introduce Hazel Cause Jet and how Hazel Cause Jet can leverage the Bezium capabilities. And in the end, I will try to uh, show you a nice demo. If it works, of course, there is always the demo syndrome, but I, I, this one is pretty stable so far. So if you remember one thing from this talk is the caching trade-off. Um, Caching is not a magical solution to performance issues. When you introduce caching in your application, you are making a trade-off and it's either you want data faster or you want data in a more available way. Like if you think about microservices, uh, you might have a cache in one microservice that caches the data from another one so that you, even in the case of um, the, the, the service, the providing service is down. You can still have some data available. Uh, either way, this is what you want, but you make a choice. In that case, you accept that you have stale data. So the data that you will be using won't be the real data, whatever that means. It will be a, a copy, a mirror, whatever. So we have this use case, and this is a pretty standard application. We have uh, a SQL database, and then we have a cache that basically reads from the database, and we have an application that reads from the cache. And the good thing is, if the application writes to the cache, the cache writes to the uh, database, well, we can just forget about the database itself and the app can just care about the cache. So this is a pretty standard uh, architecture, I believe, and probably you are already using it. And this is pretty nice. We don't need to care because the cache in that case is always in sync with the SQL database. Now in the real world, uh, it's really such an ideal case you generally have a component, in general, it's a batch, that will write new data into the database. And the problem in that case is that the cache is not aware of those writes. And when your app reads the cache, the cache is not up to date. So it can be either that you are missing entities, like full entities. Uh, for example, you have uh, a, a reference, let's say that in your database, you have a reference table, a list of customers, a list of countries, a list of whatever. And this is uh, your, your application. This database is not the source of truth. So there is a batch that writes new customers, new well, whatever, that refreshes them uh, every now and then. And you have cached them in your cache and you are completely like not getting the new ones. And not only you are not getting the new ones, but if they change their address, if they change whatever, uh, well, you are not aware of that and you might ship uh, the, the product to the wrong address. And that's a very, very common use case. So the idea is, well, how to keep the cache uh, synchronized with the database, how to keep the derived data in sync with the source of truth. 
that's the real issue. And before I answer that question, and there is this uh, like fun joke that there are two hard things in computer science, naming things, cache invalidation, and off by one errors. So in order to keep the cache in sync, one of the way is to invalidate entries that are stale. And there is a, a semantics uh, definition that I just want to, uh, to introduce you to. The, you might have heard about cache eviction and cache invalidation. Those are completely separate concerns. Um, cache eviction is about the fact that your cache has a limited size. Uh, if your cache doesn't have a limited size, you are in other troubles. Uh, in general, junior developers, and I'm like, I'm guilty of that. Uh, we try to be smart and we say, oh, we need a cache. So uh, we will use a map. Map, of course, has an unbounded size. And though what happens is that uh, at some point, your cache grows and grows and grows and takes too much space and you have got an out of memory error. So first, just like render you a service uh, be nice with yourself, use a professional caching solution, can be in hassle cost, it can be something else, but use one because then you can configure a limit. So we have a cache with a limit, and now we have a new entity that needs to uh, we need we want to put in the cache, but the cache is full. So which entity do we remove? And that's cache eviction. And in general, uh, we have policies even better if they are pluggable. Uh, so you can remove the least recently used entity or the least frequently used entity. Those are the most common. You can also have your own. You can have like with every uh, entity that you put in the cache, you can have a priority and you can evict uh, the ones that have uh, the less priority. I mean, you can probably write your own depending on the cache provider that you are using. This is cache eviction. Cache invalidation is different. It's connected to the ID of time to live, TTL. And the ID is when you put an item in the cache, in general, you say how long it's valid. And after that time, there will be a background thread or it depends on the implementation that we remove this entity from the cache. This is cache invalidation. And well, the idea is to really, really like configure this cache invalidation in a fine-grained way. And this TTL is very hard to choose. And that's the, the, the thing of the, the quote before that, yeah, it's a hard thing in computer science because think about this. So let's suppose we have a, a, a batch that runs at regular intervals. Let's say that it runs every hour. And so we must choose the update frequency, uh, the, the TTL, so that it's around the hour. Because if we have actually, let's say, a, a time to live of two hours, that means that during that time, the batch will have run. And during one hour, we will have new or updated items into the source of truth that the cache, the cache didn't fetch. So we will miss updates. On the opposite side, if our window, if our TTL is smaller than the scheduled frequency, then we will fetch more often than necessary. So the idea is to choose the correct time to live. And the real issue, of course, is it's easy to say, I have a batch that runs every hour, so we we'll, will just have a TTL of one hour. Well, guess what? If you have done any distributed systems, you know that it's not possible to synchronize the clocks like very perfectly. Um, so it's it's an issue actually. So you could say, hey, if the cache provider cannot do that, uh, we will have a polling process. So perhaps uh, the polling process will be run on the same machine that runs the batch. And perhaps then it's not really pulling, perhaps it's pushing, but whatever. It might be good, but um, we must then synchronize both of them so that they run at the exact same time. And in reality, it's very, very seldom that the batch 
like is scheduled exactly at every hour. Perhaps it's another process that updates the cache and it doesn't run like at a regular interval. And then we've got the same issue then with uh, the caching provider on TTL. We have no clue. We, we must, in that case, like get on the safer side of things and, and choose a very, very like uh, small uh, TTL, which doesn't help us. So the first idea is, okay, let's go even driven. And even driven is not only a buzzword, it's a good idea in that case for uh, stuff that happens uh, without any regularity. That means that if no writes happen, there is no need to update the cache. And as soon as a write happen, then we get the, the data. That sounds pretty, pretty solid. And if you have, done any database stuff and I tell you about even driven, you will probably think about triggers. So that's also what I thought of. Uh, the first thing is not all SQL databases, they implement triggers. That's the first limitation. And the second limitation is if you implement a trigger, it's to, in general, to execute a SQL query or a SQL update or whatever but it stays inside, inside the database. Now we want to update the cache. So we want to update something that is outside the scope of the database. We probably want to call an external process. So we need a trigger that is smart to do that. Hmm. So I checked how it could be done and I found the example of MySQL. MySQL actually implements triggers. Um, so it's a good use case. And the first thing is, well, you, you must write this like function in C++. Well, I don't know about you, um, but in 20 years, I didn't write a single line of C++. I just had like a couple of hours of courses about C++ more than 20 years ago. Not sure I could write any valid or good C++ right now, but imagine you find the right expert and you make him write C++. Another constraint is that the operating system must support dynamic loading, which I believe is not a great idea regarding security. You probably want to have everything static and even more so in the realm of container. And well, you've got more constraints. If you are interested, you can check the documentation, but it doesn't look like, like a walk in the port. Fortunately, somebody already created this generic function for us. Um, I didn't check recently, it's on GitHub, so I didn't check um, if it was maintained, but basically you can create your trigger and then you have, you have got this sysexec call. So you only write, need to write your comment here. I'm sending SQL, which is stupid, but anyway, you can, you can like execute any system call and, and it works. And so it's fine. But as an architect, um, I have a couple of comments on that. First, it's it's like completely implementation dependent. Eh? It only works for MySQL in this version and perhaps in the next version, the generic library won't work. So meh, buff, not great. As I mentioned, yeah, it's fragile. It might not work afterwards and we don't want that. Uh, something that is probably out of the thinking of many developers, including myself, is, hey, once we have done it once, it works. Who will debug it if it breaks? Because it will break. I mean, so something like that, where there are a lot of moving parts, will break. Who will debug it? It will be the developer who, like, did it. It will be a DevOps person. It will be the database. Uh, administrator, uh, no clear responsibility, nobody will do it. And then they will probably need to like change it every now and then who will maintain it. And that needs to be addressed by the organization, which as you probably know, are the hardest problems uh, in our uh, technical person lives. If you have done also any, any uh, work around triggers, you know that they are pretty resource consuming. If you do, if you call them too frequently, so that's 
perhaps not a super great idea. And now comes change data capture. And I believe that you have heard about change data capture. If you look at the, the definition of Wikipedia, actually, it's the, the concept itself is very easy. It just means that, hey, you just track the data that has changed and you act upon it. So it's it's a very wide and generic and abstract definition. And if you look at the same article, you see that um, probably you have already implemented change data capture. Um, because if you poll and you look at the timestamp to understand uh, whether you should do something or not, hey, it's considered by Wikipedia standards as change data capture. The same with version, no version number of status on, on columns. Uh, also, triggers are considered an implementation of change data capture. But the, the, the one implementation that actually uh, is pretty popular right now, it's, it's lock scanners. So what are lock scanners? The idea is that in all, let's say most, because I cannot say all, I don't know enough, but most databases, um, when you receive a write, or let's say something that changes either the state or the structure of the database, you write it down in a file. So they are called differently depending on, on the exact database. Um, like in MySQL, they call it the bin log. Sometimes you might say this transaction log, but it's just an append only file. And um, you, you might know Martin Kleppen. And in this article on the Confluent blog, he talks about the binary log in a very interesting way. So what he says is, Developers, they use the SQL database in a very abstract way. Like the idea behind the traditional SQL database is you don't know its architecture. You are just, if you are a Java developer, let's be very concrete. You are just wants to know the URL. You want to know login, sorry, username, password, the driver to use. And if you use probably uh, not SQL that is specific to a database. You can probably change database, although it never happens. I agree, but it's very abstract. It's just like a stuff with tables. But um, if you are in charge of uh, like administrating this database, if you are an ops person, then you must think about, hey, what if my database fails, because it's not if it fails, it's, it's when it fails. Um, which gives us back to this bin log stuff. So the idea is the first thing when the database received something that changed the state of the structure is writing down the file. Afterwards, the process, any process may fail. You might restart the database. It will read that from this file. And now I have my cat that is scratching my legs, which makes it very hard to focus. So go away, please, or just, sorry, two seconds. Um, so that's the first idea is if you have one single node, it fails. Well, it can restart where it failed and you don't lose anything. The second idea is that in general, and now it's here, so you can, everybody can see my cat. Hello, say hello. I think that is one of the most famous cases because every time I do a talk now, it goes to me and he needs to scratch my leg to get some attention. So the idea is, in general, you don't have a single node. Um, you probably have a cluster. And because those traditional SQL databases, they were designed in a time where horizontal scalability was really not an issue. They are just designed about one leader and one follower. So you have a failover. If the leader fails, then the follower will take the lead. And then everything that the leader did, especially the writing part, the update part, will be the responsibility of the follower. So the follower will be the new leader. And how do you do that? Well, with the bean log again. So again, when the leader receives uh, write, it will write it down into this bin log. And then the follower will replicate the state of the leader 
by executing and having a cursor on the same, the exact same file. And so they will have the same state. And when the leader fails, then the follower becomes a new leader and has the exact same state so that you as a developer, you don't care, it's just an implementation detail. So two reasons for the log, data recovery when you have a single log or replication when uh, you have a cluster. So the idea is, hey, let's hack the log. And this is, for example, a sample of MySQL bin log. And if you know some SQL, you can already see an update and a where and a set and a lot of stuff that is very, very implementation specific. So it, it looks like the Rosetta Stone. Uh, you need to dig into uh, the documentation to understand everything. And it looks like we had the same issues as before. It's implementation dependent because every um, database will have its own implementation of the bin log. And um, the demo afterwards that I will show you, uh, first I, I tried to do to, to use the MariaDB, which is a fork on MySQL and I thought, hey, I can use MariaDB, uh, but they have a different bin log than MySQL and it didn't work. So this is implementation dependent again. This is fragile. It is even more fragile than the, the previous stuff. And finally, who will maintain the it? So I, I, I don't want to do that. And then come the Bayesian. And I think that you, I assume that you have heard about the Bayesian before. And you can think about the Bayesian just like as, uh, as the, let's say, uh, a java.sql API. So you have the SQL, the Java SQL API, and then you have plugins. And Divisium does the same for change data capture. You have these like abstract API, and then you put connectors. This is provided by Red Hat. This is licensed under the Apache V2 license, so it's open source. There is an issue with Divisium. Well, for me, this, this is an issue. It's very, very skewed toward Kafka. So the idea behind Debezium is that uh, you will uh, have your Kafka cluster running with your topics, whatever, and then you will configure Debezium and to like capture the changes of MySQL, of Postgres, or all the databases that you need and are supported. And when there is a change, you will write this event into the topic or into multiple topics, or perhaps you, uh, you will have two connectors writing into the same topic. That's not important. That's um, context dependent, but this is the usual use case of Debezium. You have Kafka and then you have change data capture and you write into Kafka. That's how the API works. As I mentioned, you have plugins. So you have an abstract API and then you will at runtime change the plugins. Um, the last time I checked, those were the production ready plugins. So MySQL, Postgres, MongoDB, which is not SQL, and Microsoft SQL Server. And a couple of them were already incubating. Of course, nothing prevents you from writing your own, uh, but probably it's not that fun. So perhaps better like as a community of writing plugin. Anyway. This is where Hazelcast Jet uh, comes in because the ID, remember, is to solve the caching problem. And so the caching is to be very fast. And here in that case, if we use Kafka, that means that we will like put something into Kafka on disk, we will write on disk, and then we will need to read from disk again. And I don't believe that's a very, very uh, smart stuff to do if we are focused on performance. So what we will be using will be a stream processing engine. And JET is one such stream processing engine. Of course, there are others. Um, it's distributed. So again, it's you can have a cluster with several nodes, and it will distribute the workload. It's everything happens in memory, although you can like read from disk or write to disk, but all the intermediate states they can be in memory and they should be in memory. Uh, it's also Apache V2 license, although we have a, a Jet Enterprise offering, but everything that I show you uh, is completely open source. 
So this is as any stream processing engine. You can read from like existing sources. You can write uh, to existing scenes or targets. And there is an API to write your own. And in the middle, you can do the traditional operation. So you can, of course, map, you can filter, or you can aggregate. Uh, something that might be interesting to you also is you can like enrich. So in general, when you have a stream of events, you don't stream the whole data. You only have, for example, the ID of a vehicle. But in the end, in the target, you want to have the completely self-contained data. So you will probably need to fetch the details of the vehicle from somewhere. It might be an API, it might be a database, it might be something. Um, and every time you do this call or you do this query, of course, it takes time. So the idea is to like load everything into memory before. And so in memory means in JET. And so because JET already contains the, uh, the data, you only need to know which node, which Hazelcast JET node contains the data to get data. And it's not your responsibility, it's JET's responsibility. And as I mentioned, you can do aggregation if you want to do analytics or whatever. We have two deployment models. Um, if you are a Java developer, this is super cool because the first deployment model is embedded. That means that in that case, Hazel Cause Jet just you just use is as an API, uh, sorry, as a library. You just add it to your POM or to your Gradle build file, and then you start it with jet.new jet instance. And then every, every one of your node will do that. And then there will be an auto-discovery mechanism. Um, and then they will form a cluster. This is the easiest part. Um, but if you want to get serious about it, there will be some issues. The first issue, of course, is at some point you will need to scale. And you will be forced to scale horizontally or according to your weakest link. It can be your application. It can be the JET cluster. It might probably be the JET cluster. Uh, you will need to scale and your application will scale along it, even though it's not required. The other issue is, well, your application and the JET node, they will be competing for resources, for memory, for CPU. And probably you don't want that. You want, uh, like, since they will have different usage, uh, you probably want to configure them separately. So what I will probably what you will probably do is change to be like to have a client server architecture. So you on one side you will have your jet cluster with the nodes, and then you can decide which GVM parameters are most adapted to your workload, and you can do the same on the client side. Um, it has an additional benefit is that in that case then you don't need Java anymore. Uh, we have bindings, uh, an API for Python, C Sharp, C++, Go, and Node.js. So in general, if, if you have um, like a widespread language, we have an API for it. And then you can use JET without using Java. JET defines two concepts. You can find the same concepts uh, in all other stream processing engine. This is how this those are the names we use. They might differ in other. Um, the first is the pipeline, and the pipeline is the code. So you will say, I will read from that source. Those are the steps that I will perform, and I will write to that thing. And <clears throat> you write it using your SDK, Java, or another language. And then you have a client that submits it to the stream processing engine, the cluster. And then the cluster will load that pipeline and it will run it as a job. And it's the stream processing engine job to distribute it over the network and to, do, to, to execute the code. Let's get back to our use case, because now we have all the building bl blocks to have the evergreen cache. So we still have this like app that reads and writes from the cache and then like read and writes to the database. And then we have these stupid components that wreck the book with our cache. And what we will add, and here I'm very clear, that's not the best architecture. What 
here this architecture does is you keep the same system and you just add one additional port. So it's the architecture that says, okay, if it works, don't touch it, we will just add something else. And so we have this jet cluster. In this demo, I will have a single jet job. You can have a uh, node, sorry. I, you can have, of course, as many nodes are necessary, but I'm running on my machine and it's just small cache anyway. And the idea is, okay, we will have a jet, jet Debezium uh, um, integration. So every time there is a change in the database, then we it will get captured by Jet and Jet will stream it back to the cache. And so there is, it's not a problem anymore that this XYZ component does change the database state because now every time there is a change, it will be reflected back in the cache and the app will be happy to always have an evergreen cache. So now I have talked enough. I'm just checking like if there is anything in the chat, any questions. <laughs> yes, I have the, this cat, but otherwise my cat is gone. It has decided it didn't want petting anymore. And now it's time for the demo. So here the demo is the following. I will just close everything. So the first thing that I want to show is the app itself. This is a pretty stupid app. Um, I'm using Spring Boot. I'm using the uh, integration uh, with Spring Boot and Hazel costs. Um, I will create the container afterwards with Jib. If you don't know about Jib, I encourage you uh, to look at it. You don't need do no Docker file to create your container. Jib does it for you. Really, really good. Uh, it's a web application, so um, I will be using Timeleaf uh, for the front end. And then I will be using Spring Boot Starter Data GDBC to access the data. Uh, on my lap, well, on it's, it will always be on my laptop, but let's say like for development purposes, I'm using H2. And when I'm running deployed, because afterwards I will uh, run it um, in Docker Compose, I will be using a real database, MySQL. Um, and as I mentioned, I have integration with String and the rest is pretty like the dev tools, but I, I, it's not used here. So if I just use it uh, right now, I will just demo the application. So here I'm using H2, I'm just demo demoing the application like the stupid application. Oh, I, I already load data beforehand. So I have this data SQL, so I will have three entities. So when I start the application, I can have this. So you can see why I'm not a designer, why I'm a developer, because I don't do really good UI. Uh, so those are the entities that are already in the database. I can, can update them like independently. As soon as I update one, then I will load everything from the database again. Why? Because I'm doing the post redirect get. And since I don't have like a dedicated uh, detail uh, view, I have everything at once, then I reload everything. How does the code look like? Code looks like the following. So here I am using a person, person uh, entity. Uh, yes, this is this one. I mean, nothing mind blowing. Then I have the controller. Uh, here I have a model attribute. I hope that everybody is familiar with Spring and Spring MVC. If not, just ask me the question. But basically, here it means that um, they, I will always create a form with a number of um, sorry of lines uh, taken from repository.counts. And repository here, I will show it afterwards. It's not your regular Spring data. Um, GPA repository. Here I'm writing everything by myself. When I display all, I will create a form with, with this find all, so with uh, all entities. And when I'm updating, I will get the form and I will get all the, the persons and I will find the correct person, save this person. As I mentioned, I will do this post redirect get, so it will redirect me to 
here, which will reload everything from the database. Repository is the following. It's the most important information. Hey, why can't I click? Yes, I can click. So I'm using the Spring uh, GDBC template. I know it's deprecated, but for this talk, it's good enough. And I have two caches. So I have the one cache that I call the entity cache. This is your normal cache. And I have the query cache. I'm trying to emulate what you can do with um, like Hibernate's query cache. So how does it work? I have here a select. This is when I want to load everything. And so the query cache will have this only key, which is pretty stupid in that case. There is no where, but this is a demo. And the first thing that I'm doing is, hey, does this query cache contain this key? If it contains it, then I will get the value. And the value are actually the, the list of primary keys that uh, are in the entity cache. So once I get them, I will stream over them and I will get into a list and return them. Now, if this is the first time I do this query, which probably uh, only happened once, what I will do is I will uh, get everything from the database, put every entity in the entity cache and put the query in the query cache. So I believe this is pretty pr straightforward. Are there any QA? There is a QA tab that I didn't see. Um, tracking the cache via CDC events is not always 100% consistent. It is rather eventually consistent. I should believe that the cache is no longer valid. This is a very good question. And I believe I will first finish this talk and then we'll talk about distributed system and eventual consistency. That's a very, very interesting question. So now what I want to do is, yes, I want to deploy this application. And in order to deploy this application, I have created a small Docker Compose file, uh, sorry, Docker Compose file. And here you can see I have the app. I have the pipeline itself and the pipeline, I will talk about it afterwards and I have the database. So I will just first try to make sure that everything is down. And yes, so now I can up it. And the first thing I will do is uh, I will wait until everything has started and then I will stop the pipeline. That's the beauty of Docker Compose. You cannot say, hey, I only want to start this service and this service. You can say, <clears throat> I want to start and then I need to stop. So here I will say Docker Compose stop pipeline. Why do I want to do that? Because I want to show you how the cache uh, is not in sync. Okay, it has started. Please stop it. No, yes. Please stop it. Please. Please stop it. Now it should be good. Okay, it has stopped. Now we are using our deployed version. No. What happens? Ah, I love it. I love when something is not working. Ah, I was a bit too fast, perhaps. Yes, I was too fast. I hope so. Yes, I was too fast. Sorry about that. So here I have my initial data. I can still do the exact same stuff as before. It works perfectly. Now, what I want to show you is Let's imagine that um, I have a batch that can change the data. And here I have created a Spring Shell application. And this Spring Shell application actually allows me to do exactly that in uh, an interactive way. So if I can just start it, it would be nice. Here I have two commands that I have implemented. The first one is to list all, enti all entities from the database. So you can see Johnny, Jen, and John, they are here. And I have the update. And what the update does is, of course, it changes the stuff underneath. So I will say I will update the entity with ID3 with name Robert. Now, if I list, have Robert in the database, but of course, 
I'm reading from the cache. I'm reading from the query cache and then from the entity cache. And of course, it's still John. So now the ID is to start Docker Compose Pipeline, uh, start pipeline. And meanwhile, I will show you how you can do it. Let's look at the codes. And the pipeline is here. So I redefined the person class, which looks exactly that the first one. And I have the job itself, and the job is just a main function. Um, here, sometimes I need to wait for MySQL to start because I didn't know how to do it with Docker Compose. So I just have this like wait timer. And what I'm doing is this update pipeline. So this is where the magic happens. So I will get the environment. I will create a pipeline, which is a jet uh, object. And it maps to the pipeline that I told you about before. And then I will say that it will read from a source. And the source in that case is this CDC stuff. And this CDC stuff is, again, I'm using the integration of JET and Ibizium, and the rest is very declarative. You say, hey, I will be using MySQL. This is this database address, this port, this user, blah, 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 blah. Um, this is mostly declarative. Then we will, I will like have two functions. The first one is since I will be reading, I will be streaming records change records. This is also a Jet Division integration uh, object. And I need to transform it into a person. So I've created this function. And the second function is now I will need to, I, I will need an entry, a map entry, and I will need a key. So this is how I create from a person, I will uh, create a map entry. And I have a utility function that say, oh, the key will be the person's ID. And the final step, once I've done the mapping, is to write it into the cache of the application. So the cache is not the cache of JET because uh, JET is also a Hazelcast INDG node. Uh, <clears throat> but here it's something that is from the application. I'm running embedded in the application. So it's a remote uh, stuff. So here I just say, hey, I will be writing into this remote map. And here is the um, configuration. This is where you can get the remote host. And now JET has started. I hope everything is done. Yes. Now I don't do anything. I just refresh and I have Robert. So the cursor that JET had since it never started was just at the beginning of the bin log. And so it was able to read changes that happened before it started. That's the beauty of it. And of course, now I can like do changes. So for example, here I will update to with um, Chiara. And now of course I can refresh it and I have Chiara. That's normal, that's expected. Uh, but the fact that you, you can catch events before uh, you, your job actually started is very, very useful. And so this is it. Uh, I believe, oops, I believe we are at the end. So um, just a small recap. Uh, in this talk, I told you about the caching trade-off. You are um, exchanging either availability or performance uh, in exchange for stale data, so data that might not be in sync. Uh, if you want to keep your data in sync, uh, well, you should definitely think about event-based architectures. And in this case, I uh, demoed how you, through change data capture, as well as JET and Ibizium, you could keep your cache in sync. And of course, there are many, many other use cases. So thanks for your attention. You can read my blog. I generally publish a weekly blog post on Sundays. Um, you can uh, follow me on Twitter. 
You can read more about CDC and JETS uh, in this article. If you want uh, to review the code or to run it by yourself, uh, everything is on GitHub, so please do. It's always nice. You can also make pull requests if you have improvements. And if uh, I made you interested in Hazelcast and Hazelcast Jet, please join our community. We have a Slack, and we are very nice people. And now I will answer the question of Thomas. And the question of Thomas, uh, let me re uh, like rephrase it, tracking the cache, well, read it, actually. Uh, tracking the cache, yes, CDC event is not always 100% consistent. Um, it's rather eventually consistent. And yes, that's the default because we are using distributed systems. So as soon as you have a distributed system, the only thing you can strive for is either locking everywhere. Um, and in that case, if you have lockings, well, be very afraid because your performance will suffer. You probably have deadlocks, live locks, whatever, or you will have eventual consistency. Uh, the idea of um, JET and CDC is that the window where the data is inconsistent is very, very, very small. And um, you make a good point, an application with read incorrect data. Uh, but you always read incorrect data when you are using a cache. There is no way that you can read the correct data when you use a cache. Again, that's the caching trade-off that I talk about. What you can do, however, is to reduce this window of inconsistency to the smallest part possible. And this is where uh, CDC can help. CDC doesn't promise you uh, to just break the cap theorem. The cap theorem is still there. You, 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 there is no other way. But at least you will have very, very reduced um, eventual consistency. And think about it. Um, that, that's a very interesting question. We are engineers. I am an engineer. And yes, we think that we always want to have the correct data, um, even not in the field of mathematics. But I spent quite a lot of years in e-commerce. And I've came, come to realize that actually it's not that really true. Imagine we would have uh, an e-commerce architecture based on microservices. So you would have your catalog microservice, you would have your pricing microservice, you would have your checkout microservice, you would have your payment microservice, and so on and so forth. So when you go to checkout, you want to get the latest prices. And this is a, a microservice architecture. So what happens? If um, at this time, when you call uh, the payment microservice, the, my, the payment microservice is down, well, you cannot get the prices. And so what happens for your business? Well, you cannot sell. And I believe that no business manager would be happy about that. So in general, the trade-off, and this is a very good trade-off actually, is to say, okay, what we will do is we will cache the prices inside the checkout microservices and so there is a chance that the prices are not the real one, are not the exact one. And we don't care that much because it's better to sell at a slightly outdated price than not sell at all. And of course, on some transactions, we will win some money. On some other transactions, we will lose some money. And when you say win or lose, they will always win money, but they will win more than expected or less than expected, at the end of the day, it will probably be averaged, but most importantly, they will have sold their ware. And that's the important bit. And in a lot of cases where we as engineers think about, hey, but wait, we don't have the correct data, correct data is not that important. It's better to have slightly correct data available and fast than to have the correct data that never comes. That's, that's at least my experience and my mindset right now. Are there any other questions? And it was a very good question, actually. Very, very good. And thanks for the question. Great. Thank you, um, Niklas. Um, we'll still wait until some other questions are popping in. I have a question for you. 
So like how much throughput get you do you get through the pipelines? Uh, the question is a very good question. And then I have my consulting answer. It depends. Obviously, but no, it depends on it, it depends on where you're reading from. It depends on what hardware you have. It depends on how many nodes you have. It, it, it's it's I mean, I, I cannot it depends in this case is really dependent on so many factors that uh, there is no clear cut uh, answer to that. If you are interested in that, if, if this, what I showed you, fits one of your use cases, uh, I would encourage you uh, to just like benchmark it for yourself because as a vendor, we can just provide you any numbers, doesn't make any sense. <clears throat> because it, you know how benchmarks are, right? Uh, so the, the, the best is, is if, if it fits you, just run the benchmarks by yourself. Okay, thanks. But anyhow, I thought you have like some tests you're running or like, you know, th that you, you have a feeling or like you're uh, something like, like a minimal time you, you promise in, in certain regular scenarios or so. But I know what would be a regular scenario. <laughs> yes, so I know it's it's challenging. No, we we, we did some benchmark internally um, about throughputs, but not with like CDC. Um, but again, it depends. I mean, some some stupid stuff. It depends on the hardware. It depends on the exact GVM flags that you are using. You might have different numbers uh, if you just have. A, a, a GDK that is, or sorry, a GRE that is just one minor version up or down. Because yes, something that wasn't supposed to break anything actually changes things a lot. Um, so if you are interested, we can provide you with some like labs benchmark, but I need to ask. Uh, but <laughs> but I, I, I wouldn't advise you to do it because I mean, you, you can debunk them all the time. Okay. It, 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 I don't know if you, if you, um, it was before I joined Iselcast, so like more than one year ago, uh, Redis Labs did some benchmarks. Uh, they did benchmark against Hazelcast, for example. And funnily enough, yeah, there was like, you know, they were, they were scaling horizontally nearly perfectly, nearly linearly. And of course, Hazelcast was just like, logarithmic and our engineers thought what that's not possible and we redid the benchmarks and well we are still logarithmic there is no other way but uh, we found out that um, when redis reaches a certain threshold well they don't acknowledge the rights so you can basically just lose data ah, shit happens but of course it's never found in the benchmark uh, it's found in the documentation in very small lines saying, hey, blah, blah, blah. So, I mean, don't trust the vendors. I mean, j just do it for you. No, really. I mean, <laughs> I'm talking to you from Hazelcast. Um, and even if I trust our engineers, um, I mean, it's just business in the end. And your context is probably not our context. Um, so if you want to be sure, and I I for you, it's business critical, to um, have certain throughput or certain performances, I encourage you to do uh, the tests and the benchmark by yourself. Of course, it's I understand it's a lot of work, but that's the only way to be sure that you won't be disappointed afterwards. Because if I can, I can show you a graphic where we scale nearly like linearly uh, from an horizontal point of view, but I will never tell you that, hey, you might lose data, you know shit happens. Okay. Um, I have another question. Mm -hmm. So you used just the JDBC template to do the queries and you had your, your cache in there and so on. Would it work actually with Hibernate as well? So I tried with Hibernate in the first place. Um, and that's a good question. Um, and basically the way I, I, why I switched to JDBC is because the way that you create the key in the Hibernate cache is implementation specific. So I, I checked how it was done in, in, in private methods. And so if I had wanted to use uh, it with Hibernate, 
I would uh, need to uh, use some uh, like reflection black magic to get either to duplicate the code or to call the method. And I believe it was not so great. So I prefer to have something simple that everybody can read the codes and perhaps adapt them to their use case uh, instead of like uh, hijacking some like private codes. That's not, not a great yeah. idea. I just thought of like if you have like first or second level <clears throat> in Hibernate, then actually like second level. <clears throat> second level. I tried the second level cache, but the, it's very uh, it's very specific. And again, they are doing their own stuff. Um, it's not straightforward. Basically, the, the, the it's not, <clears throat> sorry, uh, the, the primary key is not the key that they put in the cache. Okay, thanks a lot. So um, I do not see any other questions anymore. So Me neither. We, yes. So um, not sure. I mean, we have still like uh, 35 people in the room. Let's give them a few more seconds to to give them a chance to add an uh, question, not an answer. I know Swiss people are very shy and yeah, they, they are afraid to ask questions in public. So uh, in all cases, if you are too shy, uh, just like ping me on Twitter or on our Slack or any way you see fit, I will try to provide answers. That's actually, that's great. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for your presentation. Thanks for invites. I, I and um, I'm not sure. Have you talked already before for the Swiss Java user group? Niemals. No. Das ist die erste Mal. Okay, that's great because then I can or we will send you actually like the the famous gift, and you probably know what it is because you have probably seen it already a few times on Twitter. chocolates. Sorry, chocolates. No, a Swiss Army knife, but a special one. Really? Yeah. I, uh, uh, I don't have. No? I'm sorry, but um, like something you will like for sure. Yes, but it's even better than this. One. <clears throat> no, no, this one is special. I, 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 it's it's it was given to me by my colleagues after my first job in Switzerland twelve years ago, and I still have it. And the good thing is when you're, it is just for for computer software developers. You have these like screwdrivers and stuff. Uh, I still have it. It has been faithful. I, I brought it to the US and I nearly lost it because I forgot to put it in my in my cargo luggage. And so at the custom, they told me, hey, you cannot you cannot bring it on board, of course. So I had to, to rush to the post office and to send it to myself. Uh, yeah, that's the real fun part. Sorry. So we just got another question in actually. Ah. And really? Stefan is asking, is it correct that using Divisium for Oracle needs a special Oracle license to do CDC? And I will answer in a very uh, like straightforward way is I have no ID. Um, I, I, I don't use Oracle. I try to stay away from Oracle uh, whenever I can. Um, I, I don't know. Honestly, um, your best bet is, is to ask... Uh, the Debezium team or on Twitter or wherever on the mailing list, and, and then you, they, they, they might answer. But I, I don't know about that. Or maybe you ask the Oracle guys, so they will know for sure. Well, they will always tell, yes, you need to pay. <laughs> OK, great. So then um, I would say people are already saying bye bye in the chat. They're also greeting your cat. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so thanks for having you. It was awesome. I think even though if there were not so many questions, but we got a great insight. And um, what I actually also liked about the examples where you were showing that you can actually run it inside the app, but also like outside in a cluster, that's a, at least something actually we can try. And like from a developer perspective before we need additional infrastructure. So that's always great. Um, I hope you are supporting this because other vendors are not supporting um, embedded versions anymore. Like there are a few of them. So um, keep that going. So thanks a lot. Danke für alles. Danke für die Einladung. Und ich hoffe, wir werden, wir werden uns äh, begegnen im Ernst, in Wirklichkeit. Oder Wiedersehen, genau. So um, I want to thank you also to the sponsors.
as you see on the slide, we have plenty of sponsors, uh, which makes it possible. And also the people in the background supporting us with setting up the events and communicating as always. Thanks a lot. And keep in mind, you will get forwarded to the feedback form and you will win or you might win like once a month an IntelliJ license. So you probably saw that in Twitter as well. Thanks a lot again for joining and see you next time. Thanks again. Cheers. And bis bald. Hoffentlich bis bald. <laughs>